So we need to say thank you. Gracious God, thank you from the bottom of our hearts and souls. Thank you for your commitment to us, for that endless love of which John writes where Jesus showed us and them the full extent of his love. And Lord, let that, that love take on flesh in our lives, our homes, our marriages, our families, so that our commitments built on that love will be solid and strong. In the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. And please, would you stay where you are for the postlude?
Hello friends, good morning and happy Sabbath to all of you. I'm Gannon. Actually, I'm out in a remote area where we are conducting very special production that I will talk to you about in just a few moments. But uh, we recorded this program early in the week, so by the time you see it, I do want to wish you a happy Sabbath and may God bless your Sabbath and your weekend and your household. Thank you again for being with us, uh, Marlon and Sheila, both on other assignments. Uh, let's start today with verse of the day that I have here from Luke chapter 12, verse 40. And it says, You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Wow. Let, let, let me read it one more time for me, for me and you. You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. How truthful that is. Uh, any, any time we draw our last breath, that could be that hour and our last chance and opportunity to be ready for the Lord. So we have a lifetime ahead of us, being granted to us, to prepare, to prepare and stay in full relationship with God and with those we, we love, and to be ready for His coming, whether it's the last hour when we drew the last breath or whether we are the generation to see Him coming in the cloud where every eye will see Him. Good morning to all of you again, and good afternoon or good evening, depending where you live around the world. Uh, let's start with our sponsors here for the, uh, for the week, uh, for the life event, actually, because we have sponsors every half hour of every day, 24-7. Uh, but during this life hour you're watching, we have the Kloppen family from New Jersey, the Johns family from Maine, the White family from New York, the Foster family from Georgia. God bless you, and thank you for supporting this ministry of God and for being partners with us, and to all of you who have been supporting this ministry, whether through your prayers or through your giving, may God bless you richly, and thank you for your generosity and for your love to support His work. Uh, lots of announcements we have today. We want to cut through them uh, as fast as we can, but one in particular, I promise I'll tell you what about this special event. Uh, we are here in front of our, a, a hospital in Loma Linda. Every one of you who have probably been watching this know what Loma Linda University Healthcare. Uh, it's a large hospital here centered in the heart of Loma Linda. Uh, some of us work for them full time and we do LLBN as volunteers. Uh, but we're here today to support a broadcast to patients, to the little children in their patient rooms of a special sponsored program put together by the local uh, 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 police and enforcement agencies flying in helicopters, motorcycles, uh, riding in, as you see on your screen, uh, lots of motorcycles, lots of wonderful police officers, helicopters had landed. Uh, we're, we're giving you a little flavor of each and every uh, uh, bit of this event as I'm speaking here uh, to show you the wonderful love these four uh, 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 law enforcement agencies has for our little kids. Uh, we have our production truck here, uh, as you see on the screen, and our engineers from several areas got together and helped to support and sponsor this broadcast. Loma Linda is a wonderful place, and a wonderful place that God put here to deal with the healing uh, for many who come from many communities uh, uh, to be healed and to return to a normal life. All right, so uh, let's talk about our next item, which is Christian Connections. This week, Christian Connections was hosted by Pastor Borda, uh, an amazing young speaker that you will be seeing more on LLBN. His topic was Global Witnessing. Uh, it, it's an incredible program. I encourage you and invite you to tune in and watch it as it airs again this evening and will repeat all the way through Tuesday. Uh, what a great program uh, re as a, and a great reminder that God giving us choices and options to witness for our fellow humans around us to bring them the word of God. Uh, we, uh, we have choices to make in life and uh, 
and we have we can make good choices or bad choices and witnessing certainly that's a great choice and a great choice of obedience and love for God uh, uh, there is a different obedience done under oppression and fear that's certainly not what we're talking about the love of God it helps us to go out and witness for him as characters uh, transformed through the power of God reflecting his love and might uh, to our family, to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to whatever we may go into the world. And that's what LBN does through global uh, 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 witnessing. We are broadcasting all our speakers who come and witness as testimony to God of their faith into the world, reaching people all around the world. So tune in. I think you will find it a blessing program to, uh, uh, to watch. Of course, again, every Tuesday live, every Tuesday evening, 6 p.m. Pacific time, we premiere a brand new Christian Connections. We encourage you to invite a friend and, and tune in every Tuesday evening, 6 p.m. Pacific time, and be part of that fellowship. And speaking of live programs, of course, we thank University Church for their continued support of providing us uh, a wonderful church service that we rebroadcast for them to you. And also Friday night, LLBN live worship program uh, that we bring you from our studios. Uh, it also comes in at 6 p.m. every Friday evening. I'm excited to tell you that we have a number of programs in the making that you would likely to start seeing and be blessed by this winter. Uh, so uh, we'll give you more updates in upcoming weeks about these new uh, develop programs, uh, and hopefully you can always invite a friend to watch and follow with you our programs, which, back to our witnessing topic that we had on Christian Connections, you could witness to so many friends and colleagues by simply sending them to LLBN. You can share with them our phone apps or mobile apps for free. All they have to do, type in LL, LLBN into their mobile apps, and they get LLBN. I have people ask me, uh, how can we tell others how to receive LLBN? It feels too complicated to teach them how to get LLBN. It's very simple, very simple. Uh, go to our website and you find out what products will help you to receive LLBN. We're available on products as cheap as $36, like Roku uh, USB sticks, to as high as several hundred dollars if you buy in a satellite dish or an Apple TV device. Uh, our program is available for anyone who is seeking the Word of God. Our website, also populated with a lot of other information, we continue to archive new programs on our website that you could be blessed by. If you miss the live airing, you can always go to our website and watch it there. Of course, you can watch all of our channels on the website uh, that you can also share with a friend. Our prayer lines are also open to you. Uh, 12 hours a day, you can call the toll-free number on the screen to pray with someone. And we get a lot of feedback from folks who have uh, been blessed by the prayer line as well. As I told you, there are many programs are coming up this winter. Uh, let me name one in particular. We have our two-hour special on October 25th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, you don't want to miss it. Our speaker is uh, Dr. Yami Bazan, uh, the topic would be, and that special is uh, the women, the Samaritan women by the well that Jesus visited with and spoke with. Uh, it's going to be more focused on that topic and Christ's uh, message as he presented to her and as he presented to all of us. You know, since we finished building our building and we're able to focus back on the ministry itself. The ministry is just blossoming by the benefits we are reaping from, from the building itself. It has so helped us to regroup, to centralize our resources, and to be able to improve our products and our delivery around the world. Um, and with our building, we are able to house more volunteers and more workers to work together to meet our needs to serve the Lord uh, uh, through broadcasting. So um, 
part of that growth, the building growth, we're also able now to go out remotely and do a lot more productions remotely in many locations. We will be hiring many other uh, churches and entities uh, in our local marketplace, uh, which we're very excited about that to help churches grow beyond their geographical boundaries. LLBN being one of the greatest blessings in my life where God showed us his work, showed us his, his character, showed us his power, how he works with those who are willing to work with him. We serve a great God, and, and we're so thankful that we have this opportunity to work with you through your support and the support of our volunteers and workers to go into the world and share the good news of Jesus as he asked us to do. So we thank you for your prayers. We thank you for your financial support. And we thank you for being partnered with us in this ministry by checking in and visiting with us, whether during the Sabbath live or during our evening live programs or through any of other programs uh, you'd watch here at LLBN. So as you hear these sirens, that's part of the event that's taking place here. Uh, no one is after me. Uh, no one is giving us any trouble. It's just the cops, the officers are demonstrating uh, their vehicles to little children who are also visiting this place. You know, I, I want to give all glory to God and thank Him for all the great things He's done for you and for us. We have to th be thankful at all times for His generosity, for the abundance of gifts of life that He gives us every day, every hour. We are so blessed to have this ministry. We are so blessed to have you as partners. We're so blessed with our communities and local churches. Each and every one of us doing our job to serve to the best of our abilities. But at the end of the day, we are all witnesses for Christ to go out and, and reflect God's love and character to others so they can understand when you are Christian, when you are Christian, you are transformed by greater powers than yourself. Well, let's hope you enjoyed this next program. And God bless you for being partner with us. And we ask you to continue supporting this ministry in every way you can. And come visit us or volunteer. God bless you and have a great time. Happy Sabbath. Welcome back. Rumors of my demise have been greatly exaggerated. I am so happy to be back with you this Sabbath. I am also full of gratitude, not only to my co-host, but to the litany of friends and co-workers and colleagues in ministry that have filled out so appropriately. Actually, I was kind of nervous, friends, to come back because my colleagues have done more than an adequate job. But here we are, we're continuing to talk about this lesson that has to do with death and dying and how do we relate to these things. Today we're going to talk about the soul, um, but before we do that, we're going to have a word of prayer. So can I invite you to join me in prayer? God, thank you for breathing into us and thank you because that breath instills us with life. And thank you for Jesus, uh, Jesus who breathes hope into our lives. And as we think about the day where we once again will be filled by your spirit and through your spirit and called to live evermore, we pray that you stay with us as we wait, that you inhabit this conversation, that you breathe into it now so that we may speak according to your spirit. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
Julie, how are you this weekend? This, how are you this wonderful, wonderful October Sabbath as the weather finally has started to shift? Yes, it's, I know elsewhere in the country it's probably already changed, but here we're finally getting a little bit of fall weather, so it's nice. And welcome back. It's good to be back. From your amazing trip. Good to be you, back. Were, you helped lead the tour through Asia Minor. Um, so how was it? Tell us a little bit about it. It was enlightening. It was amazing. It was so neat. And I'm sure you had the same experience when you went to the Holy Land just to connect in a more personal way to not only some members here, but so many of you members. I'm talking to you, Crew in Sunnyvale Church who look at us and who view us from all over the country. We had people from Northern California, we had people from the Midwest, people from the East Coast uh, that watch us. As a matter of fact, Joey, the funniest thing happened uh, to me while we were on the tour. As you know, Linda and the boys and I uh, took uh, two weeks off after that to kind of uh, travel through Europe. And we were sitting in a hotel in Twicken Twickenham, which is a suburb outside of London, mm. and we were having breakfast, and this wonderful, wonderful lady, uh, whose name was Loma Linda, walks up to me, and I looked at her name tag, and I said, oh, your name is the name of a city, and she says, yes, uh, my parents always wanted to go to this place, and that's why they named me Loma Linda, and I said, well, I actually live there, and she said, oh, well, you, you are so, so, uh, just so incredibly fortunate to live there. And then she looks at me and you know how you see this glint of recognition in mm. people's eyes? Mm. And she was like, oh my goodness, it's you. And I said, who? And she said, you're the pastor from, from the church. We watch you every Sabbath. And it just reminds us what a sacred duty this is, how mm -hmm. blessed we are to steward your time and to steward these resources that we have yeah. that allow us to speak to a broader audience. So that's just a really long and convoluted way of answering a question that could have been answered by me simply <laughs> saying, it was great, but we're glad to be back. Wow, well, welcome back. Her name was Loma Linda. Her name was Loma Linda, and so Loma Linda <laughs> in London. I know you're watching, wow. God bless you, and here we are. I, I promised that we were gonna say hi, by the way, on my first opportunity, so hello, Loma Linda, from Loma Linda. <laughs> <laughs> hello, Loma Linda, wow, that's incredible. We have to figure out some way to get her over here. I mean, with a name like Loma Linda, she's got to visit Loma Linda. She sometime. has to. She has to. Actually, she said that a lot of her friends uh, work here and uh, are part of our nursing uh, school and our nursing wow. program. So if you as a nurse know somebody that's named Loma Linda, we met your friend in London. Wow. Um, I'd love to have her here as long as you spring for the air. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll figure something out. <laughs> Well, welcome back, and, and now we're in the middle of this discussion on uh, death and dying and uh, the living, the resurrected, mm -hmm. the living hope. Um, yeah, Joey, and we talk about this this idea because there's often, right, this this common story that goes along within Christendom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, one of the most popular romantic movies when I was growing up was Ghost, mm -hmm. a movie from the late, great uh, Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore, and, Patrick's uh, character is murdered and he returns to life as a ghost. And I think the premise of the movie is that not even death can come into the, uh, into the way of true love, which I think is, is a beautiful message, uh, but the theology of it kind of, well, it kind of points out, doesn't it? This narrative that goes on not only in Christian circles, but outside of Christian circles, uh, this desire that there that there needs to be something after uh, mm -hmm. death, uh, but the inability to explain what that is, and so we we end up believing uh, that we go somewhere, that our soul goes somewhere, and then is uh, either uh, castigated with the fact that it has to meander down and along this world, or it goes to heaven, or uh, to that other place, and so. Uh, well, today we're, I'm excited because we get to see what the Bible has to say about that. Yeah, I mean, definitely when it comes to what happens after the death, there is either fascination or fear, mm -hmm. right? Um, obsession with uh, what possibilities are available after or fear about that there is mm -hmm. nothing. 
um, available after. And the biblical view seems to tread in between those mm-hmm. two messages. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, it's going to be exciting to look into that. Yeah, so I think the first thing we need to do is we need to localize ourselves and we need to define how any idea, um, as most ideas do, grows and develops. So if you were to talk to somebody within uh, the Orthodox Jewish community, they have a view that is very closely linked, and the lesson just briefly touches on it, but I found it so fascinating. It's briefly linked to the first way in which uh, our Jewish brethren understood uh, death and dying, and that is that nothing happens. Mm. Um, in essence, the first real clear, and I know that you're gonna that there's gonna be comments, uh, so I need to hedge. I'm saying the first clear indication of an afterlife doesn't come until the intertestamental period. Mm-hmm. Now there's hints definitely throughout the Old Testament, but the clear, clear, clear indication of an afterlife comes in the book of Maccabees which, as you know, is an apocryphal intertestamental book right before Jesus' time. Before that, the idea was that you did the best and you lived your life in accordance with Yahweh's designs for you mm-hmm. as you were on this, on this earth. And then when you died, you went to rest with your forefathers. Mm-hmm. And the lesson talks a little bit about that, at least in the case of Abraham and David, as, as you might remember. Um, and then you're remembered and you live on through the memory and through the legacy that you live, uh, that you leave behind through your family. So that's the initial uh, understanding that people had about death and dying. And then as most things uh, happen with a God that never pushes us beyond what we can handle, um, that belief evolves until uh, we have what we have now and what we believe uh, the biblical record points to and then some other things uh, that are not as clearly connected with the Bible, but definitely are, uh, I think, ideas that we would recognize now. Yeah. So then why, where, where do you think, because the majority of Christendom um, believes that uh, there is immediate, you enter, death is just a gateway into a new mm-hmm. life. Immediately you step from this life mm-hmm. into another life, right? Whether that life happens in hell or happens in heaven, your um, your eternal soul goes somewhere mm-hmm. is is the concept. So where where do you think though that mm-hmm. that belief mm-hmm. evolved from? Well, that's a great question, Joey. And the the temptation is to say paganism, mm-hmm. but that's an oversimplification. And so, uh, the real place that that idea is birthed is uh, there is a merger even during a Paul's time. Beat and, and the gospel, uh, the epistle to the Hebrews, as we studied a few uh, lessons ago, is a perfect example of this. There's a merger between Greek philosophy and Christian experience, mm-hmm. and uh, these two ideologies that were up to that point separate began to merge together. Mm-hmm. That ultimately um, reaches its zenith with the writings of Thomas Aquinas, who writes a wonderfully dense book called the Summa. And in the Summa, Aquinas not only outlines what happens to the soul, but Aquinas also tries to provide some clarity Mm -hmm. to what happens when we die. And so following uh, the legacy of a lot of early uh, church fathers, he creates levels, for example, um, and speaks about levels and hierarchies in heaven and in hell. And so you get this idea that stems from really uh, Neoplatonic thought that says that that which you cannot see, that you have kind of this dualism Mm -hmm. to the world, right? The material and the spiritual. Mm -hmm. And that the spiritual, because you cannot see it, is therefore incorruptible. Now that does create a problem, Joey. If you believe that the soul is eternal, In other words, if you believe that human beings possess inherent immortality, Mm. then you have to decide where the soul goes. Mm. And I think we haven't asked a question of uh, broader Christendom as to what the idea of inherent immortality does vis-a-vis the character of God. Mm. So let's uh, let's do a little exercise here, you and let's do an impromptu exercise. Mm. Um, Joey, 
Which is, the, give me the name of somebody that you're, sh that, I mean, if anyone doesn't deserve to go to heaven, uh, just give me the name of somebody that, that doesn't. Adolf Hitler. 99.9% <laughs> 9 .9 of the time, right, people say Hitler. Yeah. Uh, I, I asked this question to uh, some, some graduate students a few years ago, and somebody said, my spouse. Uh, oh, wow. problematic. Um, yeah. They, they needed to see Pastor Jamie afterwards, obviously. <laughs> but yeah, so Hitler. Mm -hmm. Now, Hitler uh, had a very limited scope of life. Really, Hitler be, uh, go, comes into power around 1936 and does some uh, really atrocious things for about a decade. Mm. Uh, other than that, Hitler had some dreams and some aspirations, I'm sure. So if Hitler doesn't go to heaven and Hitler has inherent immortality, then Hitler goes to hell. Mm. The problem with believing in inherent immortality is now Hitler is going to be punished mm. for eternity for some atrocities he committed during a finite amount of time. Mm. And even our ideas and our concepts of justice, right, are built on the notion that the punishment needs to fit the crime. Mm -hmm. And so if you believe Hitler deserves to be tortured forever mm -hmm. for something he, atrocious as it was that he did during a limited amount of time, then it's not just questions about what the Bible says pertaining, and we're gonna talk about that pertaining to death, it's also questions about the kind of God mm. that would set the system up. And, and God doesn't seem to be that kind of God because we see even in Deuteronomic law that um, he actually limits the scope of punishment, mm. right? When he said an eye for an eye, a mm. tooth for a tooth, he is saying, um, you've been, you, you, someone takes your eye, you've been taking their whole mm -hmm. life. Don't do that. He's trying to restrict mm -hmm. and say, at least take what is taken from mm -hmm. you. And, and then the, uh, the ethic that Jesus seems to advocate is actually to turn the other mm -hmm. cheek and to not even take that opportunity to punish the other person and, and make sure that they pay back and get the same amount of retribution from them that, that they, the pain that they caused mm -hmm. you. And yet, if God does this in the ultimate calculus of things, then God isn't even observing his own his law. His own law. That's a really good point. And so the church, and by this we mean the broader Christian church, because let's face it, up until very recently, that was the dominating idea within Christendom, right? Mm -hmm. That the soul is eternal and it goes somewhere after you die. But the problem is even that notion created problems for the broader Christian church. For example, if the church believes that there is no salvation outside of the church, then what happens or where do the souls of babies go to mm. once they die? And so we ask and we kind of mock and scoff at our brethren, our Christian bre brothers and sisters who practice infant baptism, but you need to understand the rationale behind that. Mm -hmm. If I believe that there is no salvation, that there is no salvation outside of the church and outside of accepting Jesus, and I believe that my soul is immortal, then I need to ensure that my, my child's soul goes to heaven. Mm -hmm. And so they start practicing infant baptism. They also create this other doctrine because something about that idea of inequality in retribution that you, that you were mentioning uh, so well with the Deuteronomistic law, uh, struck people the wrong way. And mm -hmm. so they said, well, we're not gonna analyze the problem of the eternity of the soul, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create an escape hatch for the soul. And so you have uh, the, uh, the doctrine of, uh, well, you can go to heaven. If you go to hell, there's ways of getting out of that. Mm -hmm. And so you had the emergence, for example, of the doctrine of purgatory. Yeah. So all of these things that we look at now and we look at other faiths and say, oh my, there is no biblical basis for that are actually attempts at resolving a problem mm. that was created because of this merging between Greek philosophy and the Hebrew mindset. Wow, wow. And just going back to the ethical uh, question again, 
even even though Adolf Hitler did atrocious things, the one thing that he never did was choose to be born. Mm -hmm. Right? He was never chosen. He never chose to be born to his parents. Never chose to grow up and grow up in that family. He didn't choose to be born. And so, can God realistically punish someone forever mm -hmm. for something they that ultimately choose. they never chose? Right? So ethically, that also creates a, a problem right. as well. Right. Right. So. Could it be possible then that our doctrine of hell, and by ours, I don't mean the Adventist doctrine, I mean the broader Christian doctrine, could it be possible that that doctrine is actually inserted there for us to seek a sense of retribution mm. at the end of time without asking the question, what does this do to the way people perceive God? Mm. So really, hell, our concept of hell springs from our own desires mm -hmm. for retribution mm -hmm. and punishment and making sure that we get our pound of flesh mm -hmm. from the people who have caused us pain. That's exactly right. You right. said it better than I could. Wow. Um, so what does that do then um, as we start trying to unravel what the mm -hmm. scripture really says about death? Um, well, I think the first thing that we need to dispel is there's another myth that is alive and well within the within even the Adventist church that says that death is a result of sin. Mm -hmm. And while that definitely seems to be the case, we need to remember something. Mm -hmm. Human beings were not created with inherent immortality. That is to say, immortality is not something that we possessed even before the fall. Mm -hmm. That's the whole purpose, right, of having the tree of life, a symbol there of our dependence on the only being who is not dependent on anyone else, the only being who possesses inherent immortality, which is God. So even in their unfallen state, and I think this needs to be said, Adam and Eve didn't possess inherent immortality. They were dependent on God. And so death isn't kind of this arbitrary punishment that God in, introduces into life because of our mistakes. Death is, our result, is a result of our separation from God. Death is a result of us moving away from the only source of life. And so the choice then isn't that death is a punishment uh, that God has given us because of our sin, the choice is sin is a separation, sin is the ultimate state of separation from God, and without the authoring, giver, and sustainer of life, uh, there cannot be life. Mm. Yeah, so Adam and Eve did not have um, uh, immortality in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. They had conditional immortality, mm -hmm. which came from their connection mm -hmm. with God, just like a light bulb is mm. plugged into an electrical so socket. When a lamp is plugged into an electrical socket, it, it can give light. As soon as you pull the plug out of the electrical socket, it no longer has mm. light. It fades. The light fades because it's no longer connected to the light source. And so um, you're saying that that's, exact, that's what happened to Adam and Eve mm -hmm. is they, they chose to unplug themselves mm -hmm. from God. And thus the natural result was the dying of life. Right. And so... This idea, and by the way, this is, when people talk about traditional Adventism, this is about as traditional as we can get. Adventism has always uh, held up this banner, which is very, very rare within Christian families, of conditional immortality. Now, there is then the idea of separation, right, uh, or of dependence. And so, ultimately, the problem that Jesus comes to solve isn't just a problem of death. Mm -hmm. The real problem that Jesus comes to solve is the problem of alienation mm -hmm. and the problem of separation. And so that is why, and I think, Joey, this, and I know we're talking about a lot of ideas, but they're all connected in some way. A lot of our unhealthy theories of atonement stem from a misunderstanding of the problem that Jesus came to solve. Mm. So if you believe that the whole problem is death, then you understand why a lot of our brothers and sisters um, have come up with a framework that says, God needed, needed somebody to pay, so somebody needed to die. Mm. But when you see the problem uh, that Jesus came to solve, not as simply death, 
although that's part, that's part and parcel of this bigger problem, which is alienation and separation, then the incarnation makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because the true purpose of Jesus, yeah, of Jesus coming, isn't that God needed somebody to pay. If that's your view, then um, the resurrection morning becomes simply a nice, neat little post log instead of the crux of our faith. Uh, the real problem that God comes, that Jesus comes to solve is the problem of alienation and separation. And mm -hmm. that is why it's so meaningful when we say Jesus is ultimately Emmanuel, God with us. Yeah, that's, that is so powerful. That is so important. Um, so if any of you missed that, what Pastor Miguel just said is so, so important for us to remember that the fact that Jesus came not just to fix a technical problem of bringing life to people who were dead, but bringing connection to people who were separated from him is, is ultimately, and you see that even, it, even as early as the sacrificial system mm -hmm. in, in Leviticus, um, in Exodus, these, these sacrifices, the majority of them were very relational, mm -hmm. right? They were not just about a payment for a debt. Mm -hmm. There are some, there, are, there, there is <laughs> one, like the guilt Mm -hmm. the, the guilt sacrifice is uh, involves payment for for a debt, but really the majority of the sacrifices, like the burnt offering mm -hmm. that was done every day, that was about it was a food offering which has the symbol of relationship mm -hmm. and a relational connection being built, and it's beautiful. Roy, Roy Gain um, writes about this um, in his book about how that that imagery was all about reconnecting us into a relationship with God again. Mm -hmm. And so if those sacrifices were all pointing to Jesus, then Jesus's death on the cross was not just a payment mm -hmm. for a debt, but about restoring a relationship with us, which is why he lived three and a half years. He didn't just come here immediately and die. That's exactly the point. That, that is the only way that you can explain Jesus's earthly, earthly ministry. Even more than that, that says so much about God because even if Adam and Eve didn't sin, mm -hmm. even if they lived lives of completely trusting and obeying God, there still was this disconnect, mm -hmm. right? And so the whole language, that anthropomorphic, that human language that is used in the first two chapters before the fall, especially in Genesis chapter two, to try to talk about God, how God gets his hands dirty and is walking and breathes into the nostrils. All of that is also uh, with the intent of creating these relationships, right? Because the real problem that, that God wants to fix is the problem of separation. So um, God, God is, is so amazing in the sense that God isn't just intellectual. Mm. Ultimately, God is experiential. And the only way that God can truly uh, f fix that gap that has been opened uh, between us and him is by experiencing and feeling and relating to us. And so that's ultimately uh, the gift that we have Mm -hmm. uh, as Christian conf uh, and as part of our Christian confession, that Jesus became flesh, mm -hmm. that he was born of a virgin, that he lived, that he was crucified, as the Apostles' Creed says, uh, by Pontius Pilate, that he resurrected, and that now he sits at the right hand of God, ready to, to judge the quick and the dead. Wow. Wow. That is <laughs> such... There is such beauty there, right? That Jesus did, he became flesh for us because we separated from him, right? He did whatever he could to bridge that gap between us and him. Because if you think about Adam and Eve, what you were saying about them was that um, from the beginning, the challenge was continuing that connection with God, right? That even when Adam and Eve were created, even though they were created perfect, mm -hmm. that did not mean that they were created that they did not have um, a ways to grow, mm -hmm. right? And I believe even after we go to heaven, we'll continue to grow mm -hmm. because you see that from the very beginning, growth is expected That's in Adam exactly and Eve. Right. Um, and they needed to grow in their relationship with him. That growth took an off for him mm -hmm. when they chose to break that trusting relationship and, and trust the word of a serpent and trust their own instincts more than God. And we talked about that last week. 
But um, ultimately, there was from the very beginning a need for that growth. And then so when Adam and Eve separated themselves from that, from God, he again made another path so that we can on-ramp into growth with him again. That's beautifully said. And I think, Joey, that the reality then is that God is the path maker, the way maker, Mm. right? He's always creating situations and circumstances for us to connect in meaningful ways. So think about what Genesis 126 says. Mm. And this will give us, I think, kind of a concept as to what we were created to do. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image and in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Mm. Several scholars, several Genesis scholars, uh, Martin Note comes to mind, for example, Note that what is happening here is that human beings are, when living in uh, accordance with God's design, human beings serve as a link between creator and creation. Mm. God speaks and says, let us create them in our image. And he creates us to do what God does, to Mm -hmm. rule over, to have dominion. Mm -hmm. But then... God also creates us that we may be fruitful and multiply. And so there's two main tasks. Like God, we are called to rule over uh, creation. But like the created order, we are also commanded to be fruitful and multiply. And so we serve kind of as as this link, as this ultimate link between between creature and creation. Mm -hmm. What sin does is it it breaks down the very fabric of that link. Mm -hmm. And so what starts happening is we give in to uh, our impulses to be fruitful and multiply. So we give give in to, as Aquinas would say, because Aquinas didn't just write bad stuff. He actually had some really profound and salient points. He says that we start acting in the way that the creatures ask, mm. act rather than the way the creator acts. Mm. And so instead of having this harmonious relationship with creation, we start abusing and destroying creation. And that stems from our inability to recognize that we are not God. We are simply the link between creature and creation. Mm. And I think the ultimate um The ultimate expression of this is to say that we possess that which God only possesses, which is immortality. Oh, wow. Wow. There's so much good to unpack there. First of all, that we were created not just to be one of creation, but also to be a link between creator and creation, right? That we aren't just consumers of creation. We are also supposed to be creators Mm -hmm. of creation, that God Mm, partners God encourages us to continue the creative work that he began, right? To nurture creation and to make it continue. And when we sin, we break down that role Mm. and we just either become completely consumers or that that comes from thinking that we are actually God and we get to choose that role Mm. and to change that role that we have instead of um, accepting the role that God has given to us. That's so powerful. And... And yet God continues to try to to re- repair that role and put us back into that mm. role. I, I'm thinking again to um, the Israelites and how God's dream for them was to be a priesthood, mm-hmm. a nation of priests, mm-hmm. right? To be that, if a priest, priest is supposed to be that connection, right? That mediator between God and others, right? right? There is the priest of, of all mm. believers mm. that all who follow God are returning to that role mm-hmm. that he envisioned for us from creation. Wow, that is that is powerfully stated. So it's not that God is trying to do something new. Mm. It's that God is trying to restore us to that which he has always called us yeah. to, which is a harmonious relationship with him and with each other. And that eternal life is a byproduct of that rather mm. than something we possess. 
That's, I think, very, not only is it articulately said, but it's also linked with scripture. So think about uh, all the texts that we have in the Old Testament, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have uh, our favorite one, which is in Ecclesiastes. I mean, and we Adventists love to quote Ecclesiastes 9, yeah. which said that, the, which says, now, now the living know that they are to die, die, that they are to die, but the dead know nothing. Mm -hmm. We like Job, uh, when Job says that the dead person will not return to his or her home. Um, and so it seems that there is this clarity uh, Joy, I don't know about you, but I was a bit shocked that the that the lesson, and maybe it's because there's so much overwhelming textual evidence in the Old Testament, uh, but there's also a lot of stuff in the New Testament that talks about what happens when we die. Uh, John 11 comes to mind. First Thessalonians 4 come to mind. So there's there's this preponderance of evidence. Ultimately, there's even the way that Jesus understands death, mm -hmm. which is which is sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and yet somehow, some way, some way, somehow, some way, we have this narrative uh, that is that has been propagated that says, no, 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 you go somewhere. Yeah. And in that place, you're going to get your just reward, which I think is it's dangerous, not just, not because it's bad theology. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that we try to be really, really open and affirming of, of people's beliefs, and not only their beliefs, but their right to believe uh, and to have a path. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people that I know you and I read and, and would consider brothers and sisters in Christ, mm -hmm. um, Martin Luther, for example, yeah. um, believed this thing. So it's not that, that we want to be judgmental, but it does create some problems, as we've been saying, uh, on the way and in the way you see the character of God. Yeah, and, and you, you made this point from the very beginning. It arose, this arose out of a desire to do something good, mm -hmm. to try to fix some of the challenges that we had mm -hmm. and, and um, to reconcile uh, um, biblical theology with what <clears throat> Uh, um, Greek philosophy be believed at that time, but in the merging of that and trying to reconcile the two, it created all sorts of problems, um, like you talked about with the character of God. And so then, then things like purgatory and hell, like you talked about, came came into play. And unfortunately, it eventually led us to believe, really, to advocate almost for the lie that Satan was trying to promote yes. to Adam and Eve from yes. the very beginning, yes. which was that you can be yes. like God. You can take his place and you can live forever mm -hmm. regardless of whether you are with him or not. And for people that speak, particularly within the Protestant family of, of believers, for people that speak and focus so much on grace, what an ever-burning hell or an eternal heaven does mm -hmm is it really limits the scope of grace because mm -hmm. it says, well, what really happens when you die is you get judged according to what you've done. And depending on kind of how many merits you, you accumulate, um, you go to one place or the other, which pause, poses some problems in our understanding of eschatology. And that's perhaps why uh, there isn't much on Christian eschatology coming from places that, that do not have the, the same view of death that we do and some other, some other churches that have. But it also, I think, creates kind of this, and this gospel that is set up aside, aside with the gospel that says, yes, 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 you are saved by Jesus, but make sure that you do just enough because there's, there's a tally, there's a divine tally mm -hmm. there. And you don't want to go to hell, do you? So make sure that you're balancing that tally in ways that are appropriate. Yeah, I mean, there is, there is something in us. Um, sometimes we accuse, when we read through, for example, the book of Romans or Galatians, we kind of scoff the Judaizers for their legalism mm -hmm. and how they had a legalistic perspective. But legalism is not really a problem of the Jews. It's a problem of, of humanity. humanity, right? All humans tend towards legalism. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at every religion, there is a tendency towards, let's look at what we need to mm -hmm. do, right? And even within Christianity, there is that bent, right? Even within Adventism, 
we have to be honest, there is that bent towards legalism. And uh, it, it, it seems to arise from the fact that we struggle, we struggle with saying that that our future depends not on what we do, but on the grace of God, mm. that we are completely at the mercy of God's grace. Mm -hmm. And that means that even that I am just as unworthy as Adolf Hitler. Mm. And that's a, that's a difficult thing to say, right? We want strata. We want to say, well, I'm worthy, unworthy, but not quite as unworthy. Not as bad. <laughs> Last, at least I'm not as bad as Hitler. <laughs> yes. And scripture says, well, you actually are. <laughs> um, and so this does two things. It, it removes, a, 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 when, when understood properly, it removes all the pressure. Mm. Because then I recognize that my entrance into heaven is not contingent on me. Mm. And so whoever God wants to let in, God will let in, and I, I don't know what that looks like, but I bet it's going to be surprising uh, when we get there. And so I think if you have, if you adopt that viewpoint, then it, then it does provide a lens that makes the story in Revelation not only palatable, but it makes sense. So if you remember, mm -hmm. God has uh, this, this whole book, and throughout the book, the real theme of it is, let me reveal who I truly am, right? Mm -hmm. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the book, Jesus comes down. And when, when we see him appear, those who are saved, uh, join him in the clouds. Those who are lost, perish. And uh, the devil is then chained and imprisoned on earth for a millennium. And this is why the Adventist view of this is, is so brilliant, mm -hmm. because we believe in the premillennial return of, of Jesus. Mm -hmm. What needs to happen then is we ask the question of, okay, well, what is happening during those thousand years? Mm -hmm. And if you continue reading the story, Revelation says that the books were open and on the throne sat not God, mm -hmm. but you and me, those of us who, have, who, who had been martyred and hurt yeah. by other people were the ones that actually need to make those decisions. And so ultimately, I think what is going to happen, and it's just maybe Pollyannish of me, but maybe during those thousand years, what those of us who have been called to reign with the Lamb are, are doing is we're learning how to judge with the Lamb mm -hmm. like, and like the Lamb. Mm -hmm. And that means that we are, that Christ is trying to exhaust all possibilities for those people that seem to reject him. Because as we've said, right, he knows what rejection means. What rejection means is, as you, I think, so brilliantly discussed in your analogy, it, what rejection ultimately means is you're pulling the plug. Mm -hmm. uh, the lamp is pulling the plug. And it doesn't matter how much the outlet wants to pass that life-giving, light-giving power, it can't because the lamp is unplugged. Mm. So Jesus wants to exhaust every single possibility. And at that point, you have to balance something. You have to balance God's relentless desire to exhaust every possibility that we may connect ourselves to the lamp with also the necessity that true love and true freedom must imply the capacity to say no. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it all works out, but I am so glad that our view of the character of God is a God that says, I don't want to send you into a, an existence that is disconnected from me because there is no existence a part of me. And you have a place in my heart. So I'm going to exhaust all possibilities wow. for us to be connected. Wow. I find that incredibly, incredibly comforting. Right. I also find it incredibly moving that that amount of love mm -hmm. allows for the possibility to say, no, I don't, I don't want that. Wow. I love how you put, how you just described the millennium because often I thought of the millennium as being a time where we're just vindicating that God was mm -hmm. right. And yet, as you describe it, what reason does God have to put us up there to judge if not to make sure that he hasn't made any mistakes, mm -hmm. to make sure that every possible avenue and outcome um, towards redeeming people 
that there is no stone unturned. Right. Can I just pause for a second? How incredible, incredibly um, humble that makes God. I mean, mm. here is God who is the creator <laughs> of the universe, who knows more than any of us will ever know in every any stretch of eternity. Mm. And yet he is still willing to put these just redeemed, flawed humans on the throne to make sure that every single mm. th decision that he's made wow. is is just and is has has gone to every possible lengths that he can mm -hmm. to save. You know, we we live in a medical community and we talk about how the patient's directive is ultimate in a in a medical um, community. So even if a doctor wants to do a life giving procedure for the patient, if the patient says no, there's nothing that the doctor mm -hmm. can do. That choice has to be respected. But I liken God to a doctor who is trying to find any possible avenue mm -hmm. to convince this person, mm -hmm. please mm -hmm. make the right choice. Mm -hmm. This, this life-giving procedure is available mm -hmm. to you. And he's willing to call the, call in family members mm -hmm. and, and to do anything that he can find out about the background, whatever he can to make that appeal to the person, mm -hmm. even to the point of putting, um, formerly fallen human beings on the throne to help him with that process. How powerful. That is a, such a beautiful picture of God, Joey. I, and I think we need more of that in our Christian discourse because mm -hmm. it's not a picture that we often hear mm -hmm. and that we often paint. So let's, let's go back to Hitler for a moment. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Hitler's gonna be in heaven or not. Yeah. Um, but I do know how Jesus approaches those who are hurting and harming him. And on the cross, I mean, you, you do have him passing judgment on those who, who have harmed him. And he simply says, Father, forgive them for they know what, not what they do. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to think what happens to a people. Because ultimately, God's mm -hmm. ultimate goal isn't heaven or hell. It's restoration. I think we've, we've spent the bulk of our time trying to, to unpack that issue. Um, we've also spent some time saying, well, we don't possess inherent immortality. That's something that is a gift from God. We'll follow the analogy of Hitler for a moment and imagine, imagine that those six million Jews that he has put to death have spent a millennium learning how to judge like Jesus judges. Mm -hmm. And now imagine Hitler after the millennium comes face to face with them. And now imagine that instead of looking, as you said, to exact their pound of flesh. Mm. They see Hitler in, the, in their eyes, in his eyes. They turn to Jesus and they say, Father, forgive him, for he knew not what they do. That to me is the ultimate vindication, both for, for, for anyone before they make their decision, that love ultimately wins. Oh. That it's not strength or violence or power that lives that wins, but that it's love. Wow, that is a, a challenging and overwhelming picture of the love of God. And what's incredible is we actually don't have to wait to the millennium mm. to demonstrate that kind of love, right? I mean, that's what it means to be a priest of God, right? Is to be that mediator, to be someone who advocates just as Jesus advocates for us that we advocate for mm. others. Even those who have hurt us, even those who have done things that we deem as being unforgivable, God calls us to advocate for them because we also have someone who's advocating mm. for us. Wow. And that, that ultimately is why the Jews, right, the early, early Jews believed that what you left behind was your, that this is all the time you had. Mm -hmm. And what you left behind was the legacy that you may rest well with your forefathers. Mm -hmm. This was it. And so if you would have asked an Abraham mm -hmm. or an Isaac or a Jacob, if there was no afterlife, would you still choose the same God? Mm -hmm. Will you, would you still choose to live in the same way? They would have answered with an unequivocal yes. 
And so I love the fact that you are grounding us away from the realm of ideas and conjectures, away from asking the questions, what happens with I, when we die? Because scripture gives us an idea, but the truth is we don't know. We, we haven't been there. Um, and then you, you ground us in the, in the realm of the material, in the realm of today. And so today the question is, if there was no heaven, if there was no hell, if this is all you had, would you still follow the same God? Mm. Would you still mediate in the same way? Would you still call people to follow Christ in the same way? And I hope that our answer is yes. Mm. I hope that our answer is we would not only uh, follow God, but we would take up that mantle of mediation that scripture invites us to. Wow, because that ultimately was what we were created to do, mm. right? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the bird of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. He says, you were created to promote creation. Mm. So do that, even if, even if there's nothing else. Wow. We know that there is, but even if there's nothing else, fulfill the calling that God gave us. Well, I think that's a beautiful way to finish, Joey. Can you pray for us? Yeah. Our good and gracious God, we're in awe today of how humble you are, how willing you are to share this incredible work of creation, this incredible work of redemption, with us, flawed human beings. Because you don't want any, any opportunity to go missed. You want every single person to be actively involved in making sure that everyone is connected, reconnected to you. That the separation that we experienced at sin is, is, is bridged and that gap that you came here to die and to live and to die and were resurrected to, to bridge is used to, to reconnect all of humanity with you again. So Lord, help us to have your humility, to have your motive, and to have your love so that we can bridge that gap is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, dear friends, may our relentless creator continue being a presence in your life until we meet again. Have a wonderful, wonderful week, and God bless you. friends, good morning and happy Sabbath to all of you. I'm Gannon. Actually, I'm out in a remote area where we are conducting very special production that I will talk to you about in just a few moments. But uh, we recorded this program early in the week, so by the time you see it, I do want to wish you a happy Sabbath and may God bless your Sabbath and your weekend and your household. Thank you again for being with us. Uh, Marlon and Sheila both on other assignments. Uh, let's start today with verse of the day that I have here from Luke chapter 12, verse 40, and it says, You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Wow. Let, let, let me read it one more time for me, for me and you. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. How truthful that is. Uh, any, any time we draw our last breath, that could be that hour and our last chance and opportunity to be ready for the Lord. So we have a lifetime ahead of us, being granted to us, to prepare, to prepare and stay in full relationship with God and with those we, we love, and to be ready for His coming, whether it's the last hour when we drew the last breath or whether we are the generation to see him coming in the cloud where every eye will see him. 
Good morning to all of you again, and good afternoon or good evening, depending where you live around the world. Uh, let's start with our sponsors here for the uh, for the week, uh, for the life event, actually, because we have sponsors every half hour of every day, 24-7. Uh, but during this life hour you're watching, we have the Kloppen family from New Jersey, the Johns family from Maine, the White family from New York, the Foster family from Georgia. God bless you, and thank you for supporting this ministry of God and for being partners with us. And to all of you who have been supporting this ministry, whether through your prayers or through your giving, may God bless you richly. And thank you for your generosity and for your love to support His work. Uh, lots of announcements we have today. We want to cut through them uh, as fast as we can. But one in particular, I promise I'll tell you what about the special event. Uh, we are here in front of our, a, a hospital in Loma Linda. Every one of you who have probably been watching us know what Loma Linda University Healthcare. Uh, it's a large hospital here centered in the heart of Loma Linda. Uh, some of us work for them full time and we do LLBN as volunteers. Uh, but we're here today to support a broadcast to patients, to the little children in their patient rooms of a special sponsored program put together by the local uh, 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 police and enforcement agencies flying in helicopters, motorcycles, uh, riding in, as you see on your screen, uh, lots of motorcycles, lots of wonderful police officers, helicopters had landed. Uh, we're, we're giving you a little flavor of each and every uh, uh, bit of this event as I'm speaking here uh, to show you the wonderful love these four uh, 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 law enforcement agencies has for our little kids. Uh, we have our production truck here, uh, as you see on the screen, and our engineers from several areas got together and helped to support and sponsor this broadcast. Loma Linda is a wonderful place, and a wonderful place that God put here to deal with the healing uh, for many who come from many communities uh, uh, to be healed and to return to a normal life. All right, so uh, let's talk about our next item, which is Christian Connections. This week, Christian Connections was hosted by Pastor Borda, uh, an amazing young speaker that you will be seeing more on LLBN. His topic was global witnessing. Uh, it, it's an incredible program. I encourage you and invite you to tune in and watch it as it airs again this evening and it will repeat all the way through Tuesday. Uh, what a great program uh, re as a, and a great reminder that God giving us choices and options to witness for our fellow humans around us to bring them the Word of God. Uh, we, uh, we have choices to make in life and, uh, and we, have, we can make good choices or bad choices and witnessing certainly that's a great choice and a great choice of obedience and love for God. Uh, uh, there's a different obedience done under oppression and fear. That's certainly not what we're talking about. The love of God, it helps us to go out and witness for Him as characters uh, transformed through the power of God, reflecting His love and might uh, to our family, to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to whatever we may go into the world. And that's what LBN does through global uh, 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 witnessing, we are broadcasting all our speakers who come and witness as testimony to God of their faith into the world, reaching people all around the world. So, tune in. I think you will find it a blessing program to, uh, uh, to watch. Of course, again, every Tuesday live, every Tuesday evening, 6 p.m. Pacific time, we premiere a brand new Christian Connections we encourage you to invite a friend and, and tune in every Tuesday evening, 6 p.m. Pacific time, and be part of that fellowship. And speaking of live programs, of course, we thank University Church for their continued support of providing us uh, a wonderful church service that we rebroadcast for them to you. And also Friday night, LLBN live worship program uh, that we bring you from our studios. Uh, it also comes in at 6 p.m. every Friday evening. 
I'm excited to tell you that we have a number of programs in the making that you would likely to start seeing and be blessed by this winter. Uh, so uh, we'll give you more updates in upcoming weeks about these new uh, developed programs. Uh, and hopefully you can always invite a friend to watch and follow with you our programs, which back to our witnessing topic that we had on Christian Connections, you could witness to so many friends and colleagues by simply sending them to LLBN. You can share with them our phone apps or mobile apps for free. All they have to do, type in LL, LLBN into their mobile apps and they get LLBN. I have people ask me, uh, how can we tell others how to receive LLBN? It feels too complicated to teach them how to get LLBN. It's very simple, very simple. Uh, go to our website and you find out what products will help you to receive LLBN. We're available on products as cheap as $36, like Roku uh, USB sticks, to as high as several hundred dollars if you buy in a satellite dish or an Apple TV device. Uh, our program is available for anyone who's seeking the Word of God. Our website also populated with a lot of other information. We continue to archive new programs on our website that you could be blessed by. If you miss the live airing, you can always go to our website and watch it there. Of course, you can watch all of our channels on the website uh, that you can also share with a friend. Our prayer lines are also open to you to, uh, 12 hours a day. You can call the toll-free number on the screen to pray with someone. And we get a lot of feedback from folks who are uh, being blessed by the prayer line as well. As I told you, there are many programs are coming up this winter. Uh, let me name one in particular. We have our two-hour special on October 25th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, you don't want to miss it. Our speaker is uh, Dr. Yami Bazan. Uh, the topic would be in that special is uh, the women, the Samaritan women by the well that Jesus visited with and spoke with. Uh, it's going to be more focused on that topic and Christ's uh, message as he presented to her and as he presented to all of us. You know, since we finished building our building and we're able to focus back on the ministry itself, the ministry is just blossoming by the benefits we are reaping from from the building itself. It has so helped us to regroup, to centralize our resources, and to be able to improve our products and our delivery around the world. Um, and with our building, we are able to house more volunteers and more workers to work together to meet our needs to serve the Lord uh, uh, through broadcasting. So um, part of that growth, the building growth, we're also able now to go out remotely and do a lot more productions remotely in many locations. We will be hiring many other uh, churches and entities uh, in our local marketplace, uh, which we're very excited about that, to help churches grow beyond their geographical boundaries. LLBN being one of the greatest blessings in my life where God showed us his work showed us his, his character, showed us his power, how he works with those who are willing to work with him. We serve a great God, and, and we're so thankful that we have this opportunity to work with you through your support and the support of our volunteers and workers to go into the world and share the good news of Jesus as he asked us to do. So we thank you for your prayers. We thank you for your financial support. And we thank you for being partner with us in this ministry by checking in and visiting with us, whether during the Sabbath live or during our evening live programs or through any of the other programs uh, you watch here at LLBN. So as you hear these sirens, that's part of the event that's taking place here. Uh, no one is after me. Uh, no one is giving us any trouble. It's just the cops, the officers are demonstrating uh, their vehicles to little children who are also visiting this place. You know, I, I want to give all glory to God and thank Him for all the great things He's done for you and for us 
we have to be thankful at all times for his generosity, for the abundance of gifts of life that he gives us every day, every hour. We are so blessed to have this ministry. We are so blessed to have you as partners. We're so blessed with our communities and local churches. Each and every one of us doing our job to serve to the best of our abilities. But at the end of the day, we are all witnesses for Christ to go out and, and reflect God's love and character to others so they can understand when you are Christian, when you are Christian, you are transformed by greater powers than yourself. Well, let's hope you enjoyed this next program. And God bless you for being partner with us. And we ask you to continue supporting this ministry in every way you can. And come visit us or volunteer. God bless you and have a great time.
Everyone, happy Sabbath. It's that time of the service where we talk about the life here at the Loma Linda University Church, what's going on, and today is a full day. That's right. And just a quick few reminders. First of all, this is a very special Sabbath. We're highlighting our literature ministry. You're going to hear more about that in the service. Then also just a reminder that today is when the children's ministry is doing the Oakland Schoolhouse Picnic. That's at 1.30. And then also we have our Covenant Conversation, the live, it could be here in person, it's in the auditorium, or you can see it on the live stream. That's at 4 p.m. And then tonight. Yes, tonight in the auditorium, which is right in front of us actually, is the improv that we have with Scotty Ray and his team. This is the first time that is it is actually here at That's the right. University Church. So come on out for some laughs and just some good time together. And then on- That's at 7 p.m. by, by the way, Thank right you, here. yes, yes. <laughs> at seven. It's good to have a time. And then October the 27th at 8 p.m. at the Redlands Auditorium, they're having auditions. So this this is something that is a gift to you, the improv and the comedy sort of thing. Go and try out. They would love to grow and expand their team. Our next announcement, for many of you may not know that October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and we'd really like to do something special next week, October 22, after fourth service. We're going to have a luncheon. The entire church is invited. And we're celebrating kind of the vision of where this church is going and particularly our senior pastor, Pastor Randy Roberts, who's been with us for 22 years. So we really encourage you to check that out. That's gonna be October 22 in the fellowship hall and in the courtyard, all are invited. That's right after fourth service. Yeah, we really hope you come out. We all love Pastor Randy. 
Uh, we have rules of engagement that is starting up, and this is something that typically is for our young adults. It is going to start on November the 4th. It'll be Friday evenings, about five Friday evenings, and they are going to take a time out for the week of Thanksgiving. But this is something that you will need to register for. And if you are in a serious relationship or contemplating marriage, this is something for you. So go on our website, check out the form. You can get more details there. Make sure you register. And remember that it starts November the 4th. It's Friday evenings. And our next one, we've been announcing it for a couple of weeks. It's getting closer, the Praxis Young Adult Conference. That's October 28, 29. Registration is required. This is really gonna be a powerful conference. I encourage you to check that out. And then part of community is getting involved in smaller groups. And we have a couple of small groups that are happening. The first one is for our Praxis group. And that is from 18 to 38, so our young adults. They actually started on the 9th, but you can still register. I think they have, Stu, like 15 different groups that you can get involved with. So this is just deepening your relationships together and with God. So go on our website and you can get connected with one of those. We also have a small group for adults. It is called Experiencing God. It begins October the 24th, and this is actually going to be a Monday small group at 1030 in the morning until noon. It's gonna go for 12 weeks, so if you are looking for a community to get involved with and dig deeper into God's word, this is a group for you. But you also need to register because they have materials and things that they will need to get to you. So two small groups, Praxis, which is our young adult group, and also Experiencing God. And then last but not least, our monthly Ever Faithful quilting group. They're gonna be meeting again October 23 and 24. For more information, go to our website on that. All right, well, I guess that's a wrap. That's a wrap. As we always say, go to our website for the latest information, lluc.org. Please have a wonderful Sabbath. And remember, we're praying for you and we love you guys.
Well, fall has fallen upon Loma Linda. That is until next week when the temperature reaches 90 degrees again. But that was a wondrous, wondrous way to begin our worship service. Thank you, Lily. You know, the Apostle Paul concludes his pastoral epistle with this invitation. In the third chapter, the eighth verse, Paul says, Live in harmony with everyone. Love one another, be compassionate, and be humble. I am so blessed as a pastor to be part of a community that embodies the idea of harmony. I mean, think about all that happens on this campus weekend after weekend. Think about our new building, for example flush with activity. We've got a contemporary service that is meeting there as we speak. Young professional groups, high school and junior high Sabbath schools, classes for all people, including a new offering that we are just starting next week in room 2410, Jewish Perspectives of the Old Testament, 10.30 a.m. if you're interested in that. And each one of these groups is led by lay people or pastors that have different temperaments, different gifts, different approaches to ministry, but are committed to continue with the mission of growing disciples. Growing disciples. You know, I think about that often. And as I do, I am reminded, as is mentioned in the announcements, that October is Pastor Appreciation Month. Hint, hint. <laughs> and we all appreciate our senior pastor, don't we? First service gave him a hand, so I don't know if you want to top that. We all love Pastor Randy, but Pastor Randy is very uncomfortable with public displays of affection. Notice that he's not in the room right now. And so if you want to show him what his ministry was, has meant for you during the past 22 years that he has served, I invite you to do, to do that. But do that in a private way do that in a personal way, he's going to appreciate that much more. Now, there's several ministries in our church that take center stage weekend after weekend. But there's other ministries that work on the sidelines, these ancillary ministries that are doing some wondrous things. And today, I am so thrilled to get to recognize one of those ministries, I'm talking about the literature ministry. If you are part of the Loma Linda University literature ministry team, can you stand? Thank you, you may be seated. The literature ministry was birthed with this idea, this idea that stems from harmony complete synergy between the church, the academy, the hospital, and our university. And they've been up to some pretty amazing things. Take a look at this video.
So dry dirt that was formerly useless at the academy has now become a training and equipping center because the literature ministry was birthed by a dream, the dream to continue spreading the gospel. So regardless of your position, we want to tell you that we are having a wonderful celebration today at four to continue dedicating spaces and visions for this ministry. At 4 p.m. today, we are changing the location because of the weather, so if you wanna hear some amazing stories, please come to the William H. Loveless Fellowship Hall at 4 p.m. We'll be there and we'd love to see you there. And now, regardless if your life was hectic or if you experienced complete harmony, welcome home, welcome to Loma Linda University Church, welcome to worship. We invite you to stand and join us in singing our opening hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, you indeed are holy, and blessed is your name in all the earth today, and greatly to be praised in all the earth today. Dear Father, we are so thankful to be in your house of worship. We thank you for your protection throughout this past week. We thank you for your mercy seen and unseen. We thank you for the many things that you do for us that we forget to even say thank you for, dear Father. Dear Lord, we want to come before you now asking you to come very near to those in our church, in person, as well as those who are at home or in some hospital bed, Father, who may not be doing well today. Come very near to them. Let them feel your presence 
and let them know that they are loved and that they are cared about, dear Father. We're so grateful for this series that Pastor Randy is in the middle of on the family and relationships. And to that end, Father, we want to ask you to come very near to every family unit represented here today. Those who are married, those who are single, those who are divorced, whatever the situation is, Father, we ask your anointing on each family today. As our faces differ, so do our needs. And you know exactly what each family needs today in order to be made whole. So we submit these families to you today. Dear Father, we know that you love us very dearly and we want to express that love to those who are near and dear to us. This is our prayer in the blessed name of our best friend Jesus and everyone said, Amen. From the beginning, God created humans to continue the work that he began at creation. So we were always meant to be contributors and not just consumers. That's why in every worship service, we provide an opportunity to give, to partner with God, to partner with us in the work that God is doing here and around the world. There's two ways you can do that. You can place your tithe and offerings in the offering plate as it goes by, or you can go to our website LLUC.org and click on give. Thank you. Thank you so much for helping us to grow good around our world.
Good morning, boys and girls. I want to welcome you to come on up. This is your time. We're not going to collect the lamb's offering, so just come on up. And moms and dads, while they're coming, we've had a little bit of a change to our Oak Glen family picnic. We are going to be local right now, right off of California Street on um, Citrus Trail due to the weather. We're doing that instead. Stop by. We have hundreds of juicy, crispy, honey crisp apples. So come on by and, and see us. Come boys and girls, come. Come close. I need you to come close for this one. Oh, it's so good to see you coming. Well, boys and girls, Right now, it is football season, mm -hmm. and I brought with me something. How many of you know what this is? It's a playbook, that's right. I'm afraid it's not the playbook of the Dallas Cowboys, but it is the playbook of the winning team, LA Rams. We have to admit that Super Bowl stats just don't lie. Well, a playbook. No matter what football team you have, you have a playbook. Because a playbook is the vision and strategy of a team. In other words, it gives you direction of what move to make. And as a team, you have to commit to the play and make a promise to that team. Now, we have a playbook that is a very, very old playbook. Can you guess what is the oldest playbook in history? The Bible. The Bible, yes it is. Let me read you some of the things from this playbook. How to survive in a whale's belly. Ways to feed every animal in a boat. Hmm. Navigating in a hot desert. Interesting. How to use a sling in a fight. Growing a healthy garden to live in. Boys and girls, there are so many good tips in this playbook. It will take you from a rookie, from a beginner, to a growing disciple. But let's go back to this playbook here. There are all kinds of things in this playbook, and I want to show you, so come close. We're going to get into a huddle. Come around me so you can see inside my playbook. That's right, come close. You can stand up if you want. Now, in this playbook, are you willing to make a commitment to this playbook? Yes? Are you willing to do what's inside this playbook? Yes. Yes, I got a yes. Okay, let me see, right here. You. As a player, you are to have your brother or sister's back this week. And you as a player, you are to try your hardest. And you over there, I want you to be faithful in your friendships. You think you can be a true friend this week? Mm. And you over here, I want you to keep your word. Can you keep a promise? And let's see, I want you here, Chloe, don't give up. Try your hardest. And you right here, I want you to listen to your mom and dad. You think you can do that this week? And right here, Paul, I want you to keep God first. You think we can do that? Okay, put your hands in, put your hand on mine. And when I say one, two, three, I'm gonna have you shout yes. Okay, can you make a commitment this morning? One, two, three, yes! yes! That's awesome, boys and girls. Let's make a commitment to Jesus. You can go back to your seats now. Now, 
Good morning, church family. Today is a special Sabbath because Joffrey, Rafael, and Micah have chosen to give their life to Christ. But it's even more special because they've chosen to do it together as friends. And we couldn't be prouder of them. They all attend Loma Linda Academy. They're all in sixth grade. And when they came to us wanting to study, they said, we want to do this together because as we go through life, we want to make sure we hold each other accountable. And that's beautiful, isn't it? Joffrey, we've known you since you were about three, four years old. You actually and your family were one of the first families that we got to know here at church. And anybody that knows you knows that you are full of life and full of energy. But anybody who knows you well knows that you also love very deeply. You love your friends and you love Christ. You are involved in Sabbath school and adventures and pathfinders. And you always make sure that your friends are included. And that is beautiful to watch. It's been a privilege to watch you grow in Christ. Our prayer for you this morning is that as you continue and you join this community, is that you continue to grow in Christ. Now, Joffrey, you don't come on this journey by yourself. You come accompanied by friends and family. And so if you are here to support G on this special day, can you just stand for him? We usually clap in this church for the families. <laughs> Thank you. You may be seated. I remember you locked me out of my office on one of the studies that we had. You locked me out, you turned off the lights, and you hid. But I'm so happy that you haven't locked your heart to Jesus. Amen. Because you have opened your heart to Christ, because you want him to lead you, it is now my pleasure and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Rafael joined this community when he was in third grade. And just when he was starting to build a community, the world shut down. But that didn't stop Rafael. He is a child that if you see him, he always has a smile on his face. And in his friendship with Micah and Joffrey, he is the calming and stable force among them. <laughs> He is always also thinking of others, and he always stands up for his friends. And Rafa, as you continue to grow, we hope that you grow roots in this community and that this church cannot just become a place where you come every Sabbath, but a community that you rely on. I don't know how you manage to stay so calm, because every time you see me, you're hungry. <laughs> There's friends and family that have come to accompany on your journey, and so I'd ask them to stand at this moment. Thank you. You may be seated. Please feed this child. <laughs> Rafa is always asking me for candy. <laughs> you have a sweet tooth, but you have even a sweeter heart. Yeah. And because you have decided to taste the good things, to taste God and see how good he is, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Micah Samuel. I'll get through this without crying. You are the child that we prayed for. And from the minute you were born, our prayer for you is that you act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. One thing people know about you is that you are outspoken and that you always stand up for what is unjust. And that, as parents, makes us very proud. Our prayer for you as you continue to grow in Christ and as you make this decision in front of your family and your friends is that you continue to walk humbly with God, to do justice, and to love mercy. We couldn't be prouder of you, son. Son, you've come here and there's been a lot of people that have seen you grow. The number one comment I got from y'all today was, we feel old because when he came to church, he was a little boy, and now you're a young man. <laughs> but you have seen a church that has embraced you, that has taught you what it is to follow Jesus, and so we just would like to ask, if you're here to support Micah, would you please stand? Thank you, you may be seated. Son, you love to sing. And you got your good looks from your dad. <laughs> but you got your singing voice from your mom. And because you have decided to sing the song of the Lamb, because you have decided to follow Jesus wherever he may call, we now baptize you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good job, by the way. Oh, that, was, that was well done. We baptized these three together because they wanted to forge and continue to live in community. And we know that if you've come to this church, you've done so because not only do you wanna grow closer to God, but you wanna forge community. And so if you have questions about what it means to be part of the body of Christ, talk to one of the pastors, talk to one of our wonderful, wonderful lay leaders, a volunteer, grab the person sitting next to you in the pew and say, how can I take this next step in my faith journey? We'd love, love, love to chat with you. May God bless you and happy Sabbath.
Before we continue our service and the sermon series on commitment, please read with me the following quotes. Your own family circle knows whether Christ lives in you and through you. The same Jesus who turned water into wine can transform your home, your life, your family, and your future. He is still in the same miracle working business, and his business is the business of transformation. It often happens that when couples get their relationship to God straightened out, their relationships with one another begin to straighten out as well. In every family where Christ abides, a tender interest and love will be manifested for one another. Not a spasmodic love expressed only in the fond caresses, but a love that is deep and abiding. True love is a high and holy principle and is altogether different in character from that love that is awakened by impulse and which suddenly dies when tested and tried. Now let's return to the service. Well, friends, the classroom's a bit messed up today. The last class didn't leave the things where they're supposed to leave them, so we're figuring that out right now. What about that anthem? Was that amazing? Wow. The message, the lyrics, the music, wow, that just filled my soul. So if you're joining us for the first time, you may not realize that we are in a series that has kind of a back-to-the-classroom feel. We're talking about covenant, lessons for families, blackboard, notes, um, maybe a quiz here and there, assignments. And we've been trying to outline and unpack the realities of a theological model for family relationships uh, drawn from Jack and Judith Balswick. So we're going to start with a quiz this morning, and it's just going to be a verbal one. I'm not going to have you go to your phones just to save a little bit of time. But there are four theological themes that run throughout this model, the first of which is class, class. Four <laughs> theological themes, the first of which is covenant, beautiful. So somebody has been listening. All right, so covenant. The second theme is grace. Absolutely right. The third one is empowerment. You're with me so far. And then finally, the last one is intimacy. Exactly right. That these are descriptive of the way that God interacts with his family, the way God treats his family. And if we experience that in our relationship as members of God's family, then we then seek to carry that out in our families. Our question today is, what is the next step? So we have theological themes, but we live pragmatic lives. So how do these themes express themselves? How do they play themselves out in the life of a family? 
I'm going to give you a quick road map of some of where we'll be going in the coming weeks, including today. Now understand what happens in the coming weeks is going to be a little bit like a bus tour. There will be some destinations where we stop, we all get off the bus, and we wander around and we take it all in and we understand it well before we get on the bus and leave. Other ones will say, friends, we're going to slow down, we're going to take a look at this, and then we're moving on. So there will be some elements of both. But the question is, how does, for example, covenant play itself out in your family and mine if covenant is present? One of the best ways, this is suggested by the Balswick, not all of these are, but this one is, is in the area of commitment. Commitment. So that commitment is expressive. The depth, the level, the kind of commitment is expressive of our experience of covenant as a family. Grace. Where does grace express itself? Well, we've already mentioned one when we talked about this before, and that's in the area of forgiveness. The ability to say, I forgive you, and mean it, and live it, is expressive of a grace in the heart. But it's not the only way. Maybe flexibility is another way in which grace expresses itself. Because after all, isn't it true that grace-based people forgive, whereas law-based people tend to retaliate? Isn't it true that grace-based people tend to be flexible, whereas law-based people tend to be rigid? So maybe those are two places where grace expresses itself. And then what about empowerment? Could it be that the best place to look for how we do empowerment is in the area of authority? How is authority managed? How is it handled in any given family? Do parents empower their kids by allowing them to make their own decisions more and more as they grow older, becoming in a healthy way the own, their own authority for life, having agency and accountability? And what about spouses? Don't truly empowering spouses grant authority to each other? to grow and to decide and to change and to develop. And if we're not empowering, then we fight over authority. It's mine. No, it's mine. So that maybe authority is maybe the best place to look for empowerment. And then finally, intimacy. How do we measure whether or not intimacy is present? Now, much in the culture today would say you look into the bedroom to see if intimacy is present. You look into the sexuality of a couple. And there are some good reasons to say that. But it's not the best indicator of intimacy. In fact, I think the best indicator of intimacy is communication. Communication. When you know what's in each other's hearts, when you're able to hear each other, that is truly intimate. So as we move ahead, in the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about some of these realities, some just from the window of the bus, some getting off the bus and spending some time there, such as today as we start with covenant. Covenant. Expressing itself in commitment. So I want to share with you something that I believe about us as human beings. You may differ, but I think I have some evidence for it. I think that for us as human beings, one of the deepest desires, in fact, one of the deepest needs of our souls is the need to be loved, to be truly loved, to be loved when we are who we are, when we are authentically ourselves, to be loved at that point in time, fully and completely. I think one of the places where you can see this indicated is in our music. Go back and look at the hits on the pop charts throughout any decade, any set of years. And you'll find, I think, that the thing about which we sing the most without a very close second is love. Love desired, love expressed, love yearned for, love unrequited, love broken. All of the realities of love, we, we, we sing about it all the time. In fact, I can remember the year I graduated from college. Uh, the popular song on the charts that year was Endless Love by Diana Ross. Anybody here remember that? Endless Love. You know, it, it hit us at a very emotional time in our lives. You go out on a date and listen to Endless Love and cry and then go back the next day and break up, you know. It was, a really, it was really quite an ironic kind of experience. 
uh, singing about endless love. Or a few years later, a woman who seemed not much bigger than she was just so slender, named Whitney Houston. And yet when she opened her mouth, you said, where's that voice coming from? As she sang what? I will always love you. It speaks to that deep yearning desire in the heart to be loved, to be real, authentic with who I am, and still be loved. Profound. I would contend that God designed us that way, wove it into the fabric of our DNA. And then he says, friends, if you're in my family, that's the love you get. Unconditional love fully given to you, knowing who you are. Now, we could go many places in Scripture to find evidence for that. I'm going to take you to one of my favorites, John, the 13th chapter. It is the night before Christ's crucifixion. Jerusalem is pregnant with pilgrims. Some estimate that as many as one to two million people came into town for the Passover celebration. Jesus is, as Fred Craddock put it, curling his toes over the edge of eternity. He's facing death in the face. And this is the preamble to that night that John writes. One verse long. John 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. He knew this was the time. His hour, his time, has been a continuing theme through the, through the Gospel of John. Not my time, not my time, not my time. Now the time has arrived. And then notice the next sentence. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. To the last drop of life, the last gasp of air. He loved them to the end. Endless love. Now, some of your Bibles will have a footnote there that will note that there is another way that last phrase can be translated. Was John being intentionally ambiguous? Because both of these are fair translations. The other way it can be translated is having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. He says, watch what happens next, and you will know the full extent of this unconditional love that undergirds the covenant with my family. And what is that? It is a commitment that leads him to a place called Calvary. Golgotha. That's his commitment. That's how he lives out the reality of his unconditional love. Commitment. So when we have experienced his commitment to us, now the question becomes, can we live this out and express it in our lives and in our families? Now that's tough when it comes to commitment. You don't need me to tell you, but I'm going to anyway, that we live in a commitment-phobic society. Nobody wants to make a commitment, especially not too quickly, in all kinds of ways. Commitment-phobic society. In fact, I, on my computer, I just decided to type in commitment in, on the dictionary in my computer and see how that dictionary would define the word commitment. It gave it two definitions, the second one of which interested me most. Here is how it defined it. Commitment is an engagement or obligation that restricts freedom of action. Commitment is an obligation or engagement that restricts freedom of action. In other words, the way we would say it here, plainly and simply, is that commitment, whoops, commitment costs. It costs. No wonder we don't want to commit. What does it cost? It costs other options. We live in a world with a plethora of options. 
I was curious because somebody had told me, you know, there's an amazing amount, amazing number of shampoos available. So I thought of that. I remembered that this week. I went on my Google search bar and typed in how many shampoos are available. One of the websites, one of the hits I got, I don't know if this is true or not, and they're not all different brands because there's different kinds of shampoo under each brand. But one of the websites I got said Walmart stocks or makes available, if you order online, 500 different kinds of shampoo. 500. No wonder we're paralyzed about making choices and making commitments. So if I, go to, if I go to Walmart and I need to get shampoo and I look and there's two options, men's or women's, or there's long hair or short hair, or there's dandruff or no dandruff, whatever they have in shampoo, not a problem. I just grab the one I want and off I'm out the door. Or like Henry Ford is reputed to have said, you can get this car in any color you want it as long as it's black. You know? <laughs> Life is easy when that happens. But when you've got a drop-down menu with 500 options, you say, I can't decide because I'm cutting off 499 other options. And so we hold back. I want to keep my options open. I want to be careful about what I commit to. Now, we've had the wonderful privilege of being here on the Loma Linda University campus for a lot of years, 35 years, in fact. And during that time, I've had the immense privilege to interact with students, hundreds, thousands of them, in the classroom and counseling settings, etc. And I have noticed something interesting about Loma Linda. Students will come here. Single students will come here. Wanting to get a degree and wanting to get a... Anyway, you kind of get the picture. And they will sit down in an office and say, this place is brutal. What do you mean? You, no, nobody wants to commit. Why not? Because there are so many options. Nobody wants to commit. Because what did our definition say? It's an engagement or obligation that restricts freedom of action. In other words, once you get married, it's probably not a good idea to date around. It restricts that freedom of action. And so people are saying, well, I need to find out before. Nothing wrong with that. Until you're trying to select between 500 brands of shampoo. <laughs> then it becomes a problem. How do I make that decision, and how do I finally decide I'm going to commit, and what will that commitment look like as it lives itself out in the life of a marriage? Commitment costs. Now, we've talked a fair bit about the balls, because I'm going to talk to you today about Scott Stanley. Scott Stanley and Howard Markman are family and marriage researchers at the University of Denver. Scott Stanley is a committed Christian. Howard Markman is a Jewish person. And so they take their research, and Markman writes to a Christian audience on the popular level, and pardon me, Stanley writes to a Christian audience on the popular level, and Markman writes to a Jewish audience on a popular level, besides their academic writing. It's been interesting to see some of the things that they have found. So one of the things that they point out, which is by far not unique to them, is that marriage is getting further and further postponed in people's lives, later and later. As that happens, the incidence of cohabitation continues to rise. Cohabitation, all right, there we go. Continues to rise. As it rises, researchers are asking questions about cohabitation and marriage. How do they compare? What are the differences between them? And what are the outcomes? And are the outcomes positive or negative in each case, etc.? Cohabitation continues to rise. There have been some interesting findings. Interesting things like for couples who cohabit and then marry, their adjustment to marriage in the first year is better than those who have not cohabited. But after the first year, their satisfaction and the health of the marriage declines. While those who did not cohabit before, it increases in many cases. Interesting finding. But one of the ways Stanley applies the research is this. Two terms that he coined, 
sliding, sliding versus deciding. Sliding versus deciding. So here's what Stanley says. He says, we are now in an age where people in their relationships tend to slide into things rather than decide to step into them. And we have pretty much put away a lot of the markers of what it means to move from one stage to another. For some of you, when you were in high school, I mean, she wore his letterman jacket or whatever, or I don't know, promise rings, other kinds of things. A lot of that has gone by the wayside. So Stanley says people tend to slide. From being friends, they kind of slide into seeing each other. And from seeing each other, they kind of slide into being just exclusive. And from that, they tend to slide into an apartment together. And from that, maybe, they tend to slide into marriage. Not making clear, definitive decisions along the way, but just sliding. On the other hand, he says, are those who decide, who make intentional, thoughtful, and in the case of a person for whom Jesus is important, prayerful decisions along the way. And that the research indicates that those who are deciding along the way ultimately are in much better condition, much happier, much more satisfied in their relationships than those who have merely been sliding along the way. Does that make sense? Which calls for making decisions about commitment. The very kind of thing a lot of people don't want to do. In fact, I would suggest to you that a lot of what leads to this is a mindset that says, it's just a piece of paper. Just a piece of paper. What really matters is the love we have for each other. It's just a piece of paper. So I'm curious. I don't mean this in a sarcastic way. I mean it in a real way. Suppose you land at LAX from an international flight and you get in one of those long lines that leads you up to the customs agent who says to you, your passport, and you say to him, it's just a piece of paper. I mean, look at me. I'm American. I speak English. I belong here. It's just a piece of paper. My heart loves this country. You know, hey, whatever you want to say. I pledge allegiance. Or the cop pulls you over. License, evidence of insurance, please. Officer. It's just a piece of paper. I mean, come on. Do you see how I was driving? I'm a good driver. Would you drive this car without insurance? Of course I got insurance. It's just a piece of paper, officer. You get interviewed for a job. You want to be a marriage and family therapist at a clinic. What's your license number? Look, look, please. People have told me all my life that I'm great at listening and I have great advice to give to people. I'm excellent at it. Who needs a license? It's my gift. My spirits, my church told me that. <laughs> because the reality is, in no case is it just a piece of paper. It's everything that is behind that. Socially, legally, in the family, religiously, in the community. It's all the realities that go into that that create value in whatever field or commitment you're making. People say, but wait a minute. It, it may not work out. I mean, it, it, I see too many marriages where they're not even happy about it. Granted, which ought to put some onus on us as followers of Jesus to have this kind of covenantal love pervade and permeate our families and our marriages. So what about that commitment? Again, to appeal to Stanley. Stanley talks about two kinds of commitment in probably two kinds of commitment in any kind of endeavor, but certainly including marriage and family. One that he calls dedication commitment and one that he calls constraint commitment. Dedication commitment and constraint commitment. And I'd like you to get a feel for this from his own words. So from the book, The Power of Commitment, listen as he discusses this. He says, what are the ways in which commitment is expressed in the warp and woof of a life together? Consider these two statements. And what is reflected in each? Statement one. 
Mary sure is committed to that project. Statement two. Bob committed to that project. He can't back out now. Two statements. The different kinds of commitment reflected in these two statements, says Stanley, profoundly affect your marriage. In the terms I use in my work, the first statement, remember that? Mary sure is committed to that project. The first statement reflects commitment as dedication. Commitment as dedication. Dedication implies an internal state of, devo state of devotion to a person or a project. It conveys the sense of a forward-moving, motivating force, one based on thoughtful decisions you have made to give it your best effort. Does that make sense? That's dedication commitment. Constraint, writes Stanley, entails a sense of obligation. It refers to factors that would be costs if the present course were abandoned. Whereas dedication is a force drawing you forward, constraint is a force pushing you from behind. I'm obligated to do this. When you combine the two, it's like epoxy glue. Mixing the two components gives married couples a super strong bond. In other words, dedication and constraint are a part of any meaningful commitment we make, including marriage. If you go into marriage expecting only dedication kinds of experiences, you're going to be overwhelmed with questions about whether or not you're right for each other because you find that there's more to it than that. But if your marriage is only constraint, well, listen to Stanley. Research has shown that couples who maintain and act on dedication are more connected, happier, and more open with each other. That's because the partners show their commitment in many ways. Those who lose dedication and have only constraints will either be together but miserable or come apart. Now notice again, both of these are elements in a marriage. If you're in a marriage where you have contributed to it, you have nurtured it, you have grown it, you're experiencing the kind of covenantal love that God expresses to his family, that does not take away the constraints. You still have the constraints. Obligation to spouse, obligation to children, obligation to community or whatever else there is. That's still there. But when this is the kind of love you experience, that doesn't really matter. However, when the love has died, these can become overwhelming, become all you can see. They're both present in healthy marriages, and they both are likely but certainly constrained as present in marriages that struggle. So what do we do? How can we help address some of those realities? One more piece from Stanley. Stanley says when it comes to making commitments and living out those commitments in marriage, it is utterly important that marriage partners feel safe. Safe. Now one way that that safety is key is physical safety. If you feel threatened, intimidated, if you have been harmed, there is no way you can work on a marriage. If that describes you today, please leave this place to get help, to leave that situation. You cannot live in the context of something where you are physically afraid. Reach out to us as pastors. Reach out to a, to a Christian counselor, but get help. That's a fundamental underlying way. But there are two other ways that Stanley says we need to feel safe if our commitments are going to be healthy and grow. One of them is we need to feel safe in what he calls the connection. The connection. What does he mean by that? He means that experience that two people have when they sit and talk and share with each other open up their hearts and lives to each other. 
and feel safe in doing so. And as a result of that, they grow healthy and strong. They experience joy in their connection. It is deeply meaningful. That is a reality that many of us, married or single, long for. Long for. However, there's another safety that helps determine whether or not that's going to happen long term. And that's a safety in what Stanley calls the commitment. And what he means by that is as you look at this person to whom you are married, you look at a person that you are not afraid is going to leave you, going to walk out the door, going to abandon you. You realize we have a future together. We're both on board. We're both contributing. I'm safe in this commitment. And Stanley says, it is only in a longer-term relationship as we feel the safety of that commitment that we then can come to know the joy and safety of the connection. Because if we have questions, is my spouse going to leave? Is he cheating on me again? That shuts down anything connection-wise. We cannot be intimate with somebody we're afraid is about to walk out the door. So commitment undergirds it all. And yet, commitment costs. And that makes us commitment phobic. In fact, New York Times, just in case you're wondering, not a religious journal, Modern Love College Essay Contest, May of 2017, one of the finalists, college senior Lauren Peterson. Ms. Lauren Peterson met Michael on a dating app where women make the first move. She wasn't looking for a relationship, let alone for love. She wrote, everything about us was temporary. We would talk a little, watch a little, and then go to bed. In the morning, I would zip up my coat while he asked, heading out, I would nod and say, thanks for the toast. There was a rhythm to it. Monday night, pack my bag. Tuesday morning, walk home. Then she broke the rules. She expressed that she wanted something more. She writes, I started daydreaming about how the moonlight trickled in while he played me his jazz records, how he chuckled and buried his face in his hands after I explained my odd internships and how he held up a picture of his family and described each of his brothers. For a second, my future brimmed with Michael. His records, his quiet demeanor but abrasive sense of humor, his shamelessness in recounting the time he was struck with food poisoning at a hostel in San Francisco. I wanted more. She texted him, and then she writes, Then another text appeared. It's just that I'm apprehensive about the commitment. When I clarified that I didn't expect a long-term commitment with our coming graduation, he expressed his real concern in one word, monogamy. I wanted to leave the game behind and develop something special with Michael, if only for a short time. Yet Michael hesitated. It struck me that the fling was dead. She concludes on a sad note. A mere, a mere six weeks after our first date, we were over. I'd broken the rules. My glimmer of expressed affection had led to a fatal imbalance in the game. Feeling a little dispensable, I opened Bumble to pause my account. A notification flash indicated that I had been right-swiped right by a few people. 1,946 to be exact. As the saying goes, there are plenty of fish in the sea. And it turned out that my sea held 1,946 of them. The play again button glowed brighter than ever. And yet almost comically... I wanted to date only one particular person. It's curious, isn't it? 
has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with God. Because there is in the human heart a desire to be loved, to be loved to the core of our beings, to be loved in a way that is not temporary or uncertain or will walk out the door in the morning. There's a desire to be loved in a way that expresses commitment, deep and full commitment, commitment captured in words like greater love has no one than this that a person lay down their life for their friends. That kind of committed love. The human heart yearns for that. And then we come to God and in his family, we experience that. We see it in the pen of a man named John who says he showed them the full extent of his love. He loved them to the very end. That's our family. This community, we are but one small local expression of the family of God who is blessed with that kind of love, eternally blessed. Now the question becomes, can we love our families in return? Because while it is true that commitment costs, I also have to tell you that it is even more true that commitment pays. Commitment pays rich dividends. Commitment pays intimacy and security and companionship and the ability to rest at peace in a relationship. It pays deeply. So I have an assignment for you before class next week. First of all, just a reminder, this afternoon, 4 p.m., Dr. Barbara Hernandez talking about accountability and forgiveness in these kinds of relationships. You won't want to miss it in the new building. But your assignment, three parts to it, simple parts, I want to ask you to do between now and when we meet next week. Assignment number one, say thank you. Say thank you to a person in your life. Could be a parent, could be a child, could be a sibling, could be a spouse. Say thank you to a person in your life who stayed with you through the times of constraint. When it was dry and dusty and a desert, when you wondered if you were going to make it, and yet they were there, they stayed with you, say thank you to them. You stayed with me through those times, and I want you to know how much I appreciate it. Thank you. That's the first one. Say thank you. Second one, with somebody. Parent, child, sibling, spouse, this week, take one act, make one choice to act in some way that expresses that dedication kind of commitment. Go on a long walk and talk. Sit and hold hands while you watch a favorite show. Go down and watch the sunset on the beach. Or if you can do it financially, go spend a weekend away together. But do something this week that feeds, that nurtures the dedication kind of commitment either in your family or in your marriage. Say thank you. Take one dedication act. And the third one, say thank you. Say thank you to the one who has loved you with an everlasting love, Amen. whose covenant commitment to you was best shown at Calvary. Say thank you to him and say, please, let me live in the overflow of that love that I might then be able to share that with the people who mean the most to me. Say thank you, act in a dedication way, and say thank you. In fact, let's say thank you right now. God of grace, when we consider your love, when we consider the cross, all we can say is thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would remain seated for the postlude,
God bless you. Hello, friends. Good morning and happy Sabbath to all of you. I'm Gannon. Actually, I'm out in a remote area where we are conducting very special production that I will talk to you about in just a few moments. But uh, we recorded this program early in the week, so by the time you see it, I do want to wish you a happy Sabbath, and may God bless your Sabbath and your weekend and your household. Thank you again for being with us, uh, Marlon and Sheila, both on other assignments. Uh, let's start today with verse of the day that I have here from Luke chapter 12, verse 40, and it says, You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Wow. Let, let, let me read it one more time for me, for me and you. You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. How truthful that is. Uh, any, any time we draw our last breath, that could be that hour and our last chance and opportunity to be ready for the Lord. So we have a lifetime ahead of us, being granted to us, to prepare, to prepare and stay in full relationship with God and with those we, we love, and to be ready for His coming, whether it's the last hour when we drew the last breath, or whether we are the generation to see Him coming in the cloud where every eye will see Him. Good morning to all of you again, and good afternoon or good evening, depending where you live around the world. Uh, let's start with our sponsors here for the uh, for the week uh, for the life event actually because we have sponsors every half hour of every day 24/7. Uh, but during this life hour you're watching, we have the Kloppen family from New Jersey, the Johns family from Maine, the White family from New York, the Foster family from Georgia. God bless you, and thank you for supporting this ministry of God and for being partners with us, and to all of you who have been supporting this ministry, whether through your prayers or through your giving, may God bless you richly, and thank you for your generosity and for your love to support His work. Uh, lots of announcements we have today. We want to cut through them uh, as fast as we can, but one in particular, I promise I'll tell you what about this special event. Uh, we are here in front of our, a, a hospital in Loma Linda. Every one of you who have probably been watching us know what Loma Linda University Healthcare. Uh, it's a large hospital here centered in the heart of Loma Linda. Uh, some of us work for them full time and we do LLBN as volunteers. Uh, but we're here today to support a broadcast to patients, to the little children in their patient rooms, of a special sponsored program put together by the local uh, 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 police and enforcement agencies flying in helicopters, motorcycles, uh, riding in, as you see on your screen, uh, lots of motorcycles, lots of wonderful police officers, helicopters had landed. Uh, we're, we're giving a little flavor of each and every uh, uh, bit of this event as I'm speaking here uh, to show you the wonderful love these four uh, 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 law enforcement agencies has for our little kids. Uh, we have our production truck here, uh, as you see on the screen, and our engineers from several areas got together and helped to support and sponsor this broadcast. Loma Linda is a wonderful place, and a wonderful place that God put here to deal with the healing uh, for many who come from many communities uh, uh, to be healed and to return to a normal life. All right, so uh, let's talk about our next item, which is Christian Connections. This week, Christian Connections was hosted by Pastor Borda, uh, an amazing young speaker that you will be seeing more on LLBN. His topic was global witnessing. Uh, it, it's an incredible program. I encourage you and invite you to tune in and watch it as it airs again this evening and it will repeat all the way through Tuesday. Uh, what a great program uh, re as a, and a great reminder that God giving us choices and options to witness for our fellow humans around us to bring them the Word of God 
Uh, we, uh, we have choices to make in life, and, uh, and we, have, we can make good choices or bad choices, and witnessing certainly that's a great choice and a great choice of obedience and love for God. Uh, uh, there is a different obedience done under oppression and fear. That's certainly not what we're talking about, the love of God. It helps us to go out and witness for Him as characters uh, transformed through the power of God, reflecting His love and might uh, to our family, to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to whatever we may go into the world. And that's what LBN does through global uh, 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 witnessing. We are broadcasting all our speakers who come and witness as testimony to God of their faith into the world, reaching people all around the world. So, tune in. I think you will find it a blessing program to, uh, uh, to watch. Of course, again, every Tuesday live, every Tuesday evening, 6 p.m. Pacific time, we premiere a brand new Christian Connections. We encourage you to invite a friend and, and tune in every Tuesday evening, 6 p.m. Pacific time, and be part of that fellowship. And speaking of live programs, of course, we thank University Church for their continued support of providing us uh, a wonderful church service that we rebroadcast for them to you. And also Friday night, LLBN live worship program uh, that we bring you from our studios. Uh, it also comes in at 6 p.m. every Friday evening. I'm excited to tell you that we have a number of programs in the making that you would likely to start seeing and be blessed by this winter. Uh, so uh, we'll give you more updates in upcoming weeks about these new uh, developed programs, uh, and hopefully you can always invite a friend to watch and follow with you our programs, which, back to our witnessing topic that we had on Christian Connections, you could witness to so many friends and colleagues by simply sending them to LLBN. You can share with them our phone apps or mobile apps for free. All they have to do, type in LL, LLBN into their mobile apps, and they get LLBN. I have people ask me, uh, how can we tell others how to receive LLBN? It feels too complicated to teach them how to get LLBN. It's very simple, very simple. Uh, go to our website, and you find out what products will help you to receive LLBN. We're available on products as cheap as $36, like Roku uh, USB sticks, to as high as several hundred dollars if you buy in a satellite dish or an Apple TV device. Uh, our program is available for anyone who's seeking the Word of God. Our website, also populated with a lot of other information, we continue to archive new programs on our website that you could be blessed by. If you miss the live airing, you can always go to our website and watch it there. Of course, you can watch all of our channels on the website uh, that you can also share with a friend. Our prayer lines are also open to you to, uh, 12 hours a day. You can call the toll-free number on the screen to pray with someone. And we get a lot of feedback from folks who have uh, been blessed by the prayer line as well. As I told you, there are many programs are coming up this winter. Uh, let me name one in particular. We have our two-hour special on October 25th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, you don't want to miss it. Our speaker is uh, Dr. Yami Bazan. Uh, the topic would be in that special is uh, the women, the Samaritan women by the well that Jesus visited with and spoke with. Uh, it's going to be more focused on that topic and Christ's uh, message as he presented to her and as he presented to all of us. You know, since we finished building our building and we're able to focus back on the ministry itself, the ministry is just blossoming by the benefits we are reaping from, from the building itself. It has so helped us to regroup, to centralize our resources, and to be able to improve our products and our delivery around the world. Um, and with our building, we are able to house more volunteers and more workers to work together to meet our needs to serve the Lord uh, uh, through broadcasting. 
So um, part of that growth, the building growth, we're also able now to go out remotely and do a lot more productions remotely in many locations. We will be hiring many other uh, churches and entities uh, in our local marketplace, uh, which we're very excited about that to help churches grow beyond their geographical boundaries. LLBN been one of the greatest blessings in my life where God showed us his work, showed us his, his character, showed us his power, how he works with those who are willing to work with him. We serve a great God and, and we're so thankful that we have this opportunity to work with you through your support and the support of our volunteers and workers to go into the world and share the good news of Jesus as he asked us to do. So we thank you for your prayers, we thank you for your financial support, and we thank you for being partner with us in this ministry by checking in and visiting with us, whether during the Sabbath live or during our evening live programs or through any of other programs uh, you watch here at LLBN. So as you hear these sirens, that's part of the event that was taking place here. Uh, no one is after me. Uh, no one is giving us any trouble. It's just the cops, the officers are demonstrating uh, their vehicles to little children who are also visiting this place. You know, I, I want to give all glory to God and thank Him for all the great things He's done for you and for us. We have to be thankful at all times for His generosity, for the abundance of gifts of life that He gives us every day, every hour. We are so blessed to have this ministry. We are so blessed to have you as partners. We're so blessed with our communities and local churches. Each and every one of us doing our job to serve to the best of our abilities. But at the end of the day, we are all witnesses for Christ to go out and, and reflect God's love and character to others so they can understand when you are Christian, when you are Christian, you are transformed by greater powers than yourself. Well, let's hope you enjoyed this next program. And God bless you for being partner with us. And we ask you to continue supporting this ministry in every way you can. And come visit us or volunteer. God bless you and have a great Saturday.